Good morning and welcome to Sunday Supplement. Yet another week where there's no action on the pitch, but feverish activity off of it as the various authorities try and get the game going once again, or in some cases, the season curtailed as it stands. Bring us all the stories behind the latest developments. I'm delighted to say this morning we're joined by Jason Burt, the Chief Football Correspondent at The Telegraph, Sean Custis, Head of Sport at The Sun, and Alison Rudd, sports writer at The Times. Morning to you all. But first of all, let's get a flavour of today's papers and what's making the headlines this morning. Sam Wallace has got a nice piece in The Telegraph talking about the positivity after the second COVID test came back yesterday, the results. And out of 996 players and staff, only two were positive. Remember, there was previously six the week before. Also further in the piece... The fact that uh, BAME players advisory group were addressed by a government public health expert, Jonathan Van Tam, on Friday to try and give them some reassurances about their potential exposure to COVID-19. Interesting piece in The Sun as well. David Dean, former Arsenal vice chairman, of course, has come up with a proposal. He said he wants to see next season recalibrated with this season unlikely to end in June or July, why not don't put pressure on ourselves and let's finish in October or November and then run next season from February to November. Interesting thoughts there from David Dean. Yesterday, Spain signalled its intention to return. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez declared that he wanted top-level sport, particularly La Liga, to resume on June the 8th. Very soon indeed. The big boat this week, of course, though, is on Wednesday. That is when players will be looking at returning to full contract training on the Thursday, if voted by the clubs on the Wednesday. We'll be talking in depth about that one later on. And also Joe Bernstein in the mail, um, talking about problems with the FA Cup next season. Some of the minnows, this glorious competition, which really one of its beauties is that Every amateur club virtually can enter it. That's not going to be the case because the rounds in August could be scrapped, obviously, as well. There's financial problems as well. So not just the FA Cup, but Carabao Cup as well, also facing difficulties. So, as we said, it's all about football's resumption or curtailment, depending on which league you're in. Jason Burt, I know you've been looking at this very closely this week. What would you think are the next key steps and also how do you see this chat on Wednesday with regard to going to full contact training on Thursday going? What are the obstacles that need to be overcome and also what's what do you sense is the mood of clubs and players to return to full contact training and, and perhaps as well your colleague Sam Wallace in the Telegraph, how much do you think that chat will be influenced by the fact that only two tests came back positive out of 996? I think every week we're saying is a crucial week for the Premier League and for football and this week though feels almost the most crucial so far. We've got two big meetings this week involving the Premier League clubs on Wednesday and on Friday and on Wednesday obviously they're going to have to vote for the next stage of the protocols as, as you mentioned. I think before then is quite interesting. The next couple of days I think there's going to be a lot, lot of conversations taking place with players and with managers and with clubs from the Premier League to try and convince them the next stage is safe and is worth going to. And it's quite interesting how that has shifted because previously they presented the ideas to the clubs first and then to the players and then to the managers. And I think there's been a bit of pushback on that and that the managers and players, rightly so, because they're the ones actually at the front line, are going to have to be uh, convinced first that it's worth going forward with the next stage. I think the stage one protocols in some ways were quite simple and quite easy to understand and also quite easy to implement. I think the stage two protocols moving towards contact training and contacting games is the one where they're going to have a real difficulty persuading some players and managers. I think the hope is that because stage one so far has gone well and we've seen the number of tests results come back positive going down slightly, I think hopefully people feel a little more confident going forward. And I think as Sam's piece says this morning, I think a key area was convincing some of the BAME players actually because we know there's a heightened risk um, that, that it was safe for them to go back and I think those conversations have been quite crucial. Um, hopefully they've worked and that some of these players' concerns have been assuaged. But it is a 
I think it's in the balance. I really do. I don't think it's a given that everyone will, will sign up and go forward because it's going to be difficult if on Wednesday we have a vote and there isn't a consensus between the clubs. The last one was unanimous. Obviously, the Premier League will hope the next one is unanimous. If it's not, then that's, that's a bit dangerous because it shows cracks in Project Restart and maybe that there isn't that unanimity in terms of getting football back on. Sean, are you hearing similar things in terms of the vote ahead of Wednesday? What, what's your sense of what the mood amongst players and managers is? Or, and, and how much has that mood changed since they've returned to non-contact training? Because it's, it's quite a step up, isn't it? It is. I, I would agree with what Jason said there. I think there was... Uh, I was heartened last night by um, the fact there was only two positive tests. I think that's greatly encouraging. But I don't think that will necessarily persuade the BA. ME players that it's all sorted. I still think, as Jason said, there's huge concerns among those players. There's also, I would say, probably splits between the managers. On the one hand, you've got the likes of Klopp and Deitch who are quite bullish about coming back. Not not at the expense of their players, but they're very keen to get uh, things going. Klopp, you probably understandably. And then you've got like Nigel Pearson, Frank Lampard, though he's not been publicly on the record about it, really, recently a bit more reticent. Um, th there is no consensus at the moment. I still think there's going to be a lot of talking, as Jason says, this week before we get to a consensus. And we probably won't even be at that by the end of this week that everybody's agreed. They would, Everybody sort of wants to play football, but very, very few, I would say, are 100%, let's go, let's do it, um, whatever. That, that said... They will be heartened, I think, also by what's been going on in Germany. Another weekend uh, looks like relatively successful. And for every weekend you get of successful Bundesliga games, I think the, the pressure probably comes on the Premier League more to restart. Alison, do you agree with Jamie Carragher? Um, he, he doesn't quite understand the reticence of certain players, not obviously exceptions, maybe some, who's at a heightened risk or lives with a relative who's particularly vulnerable. But once the players have been tested, then the training ground is probably one of the safest places you can be because you know that everybody there you're in contact with has been tested, safer than you and I going to the supermarket or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, you could make a case that footballers are in, in quite a privileged position in that sense. If you think of uh, garden centres, for example, they're coming back because they help the mental health of the nation but the staff there will not go through the procedures that footballers will go through and they are coming back partly for that reason aren't they to help the nation's spirits be boosted and they're doing so almost in a bubble not quite you're absolutely right the the amount of effort and money put into making sure that they they're not at risk as far as we can tell when they're playing. I, I, it is really important, though, to, to differentiate between a natural hesitancy to move forward because we've, we've all been told, and footballers are part of the community, they've been told, be alert, be safe, don't mingle, obey by rules. And they're suddenly being told to do something the opposite of that. And they're bound, just as human beings, to feel that it feels slightly wrong in some way. And I'm sure those players who are just purely struggling to adjust will, once they see um, how it helps people come back to not feeling like it's normal and see more games abroad happening, they will gradually feel better. But we must not forget that there's a lot of science yet to be explained about the disparity in the contraction of the illness from the BAME community. I've read lots of conflicting reports still on that. And, um, yeah, they say if you strip away the socioeconomic factors, there is no actual difference. But I, I, that's only one report. I think we need, they, you know, players need to see that they're getting the best science and it's, it's spelled out quickly. But I think the other thing is we're at a stage, we're at a crucial stage, as Jason said, that we don't, we don't know exactly what the votes will be. But I think if we, can, if we can assume that there's going to be votes saying, yes, let's play, now's the time, I think, for managers, like Chris Wilder has done, to sort of get in that buoyancy from the start. Yeah, we're ready. We want to play. It's going to be difficult, I think, for some teams to go into matches where their club and their manager and everyone around them 
has been on the more hesitant side. So you, you sort of take a running jump. You've got to get going, get the momentum going now and assume that you're going to be playing at the end of June. I think the, ret I think the reticence comes from some players. They think training at the moment, pretty much OK, but full <coughs> contact is very different. Now you can say, oh, well, they've been tested, it's all clear. But even then, some people don't trust the testing. Now, if we, we're probably most of us working from home and the prospect of going back to work, say, if you had to go into the office, you're like <coughs> charting your way. How do you do that? How do I go into work and, and chart my way through, be it on the train or the tube or cycling, maybe? You can possibly plot it and stay out the way of people maybe all the way through the day and all the way back, say, if you cycled in and all that. Footballers cannot do that once they are in full contact training, and especially in a full contact match. They are at the mercy of other people in a way we don't necessarily have to be. So I think you have to cut them some slack in that regard and understand their concerns. I, I, do, I do understand that, but I think also there's almost a psychological barrier now with the players. I think we, we, we've talked about obviously football being different in terms of obviously it's not the same as our jobs or other people's jobs. But one of the key things I think the, the advisors and the, the government, the, the medical advisors in particular, have to get across in the next few days to the players is actually contact on a football field is quite minimal. I know people will roll their eyes at that, but the number of seconds you actually spend in contact with somebody else on a football field over 90 minutes is quite minimal. And the big issue as well, I think, that needs to get across is that the chances of transmission outdoors are so much lower than indoors. And I think there's almost psychological barriers that need to be overcome with the players to try and convince them that this is safer than they probably think it is. Plus, also, we've got this incredibly um, rigorous testing regime and also the hygiene protocols will all stay in place by and large. So you, you are creating these almost sterile bubbles in which they're going to be playing football. They're also in an age group where, and, and a demographic and, and obviously in terms of their fitness where their, their risk is lower. Now, the, the big concern really is if, if people, people in their households or family members contract it or they bring it home. And I, I completely understand those concerns, but for the actual players themselves, if they can keep creating this sterile atmosphere as long as possible and almost get over that psychological barrier of going back and playing football, I think that's going to be the key, key to the game starting again. Jason, I'm interested in something you said there. Uh, the science says there's minimal contact in football. You yeah. see you know, people with rolling mm -hmm. eyes. Is that, is that yeah. specifically physical contact? But surely there's, yeah. a, there's as much danger of being in close proximity. I mean, forget two metres, you can be nose to nose with people. You can be stood right, even if there isn't physical contact, you can be that far apart. So I, I, that doesn't I totally really understand tell, that. Does that really yeah. tell the whole picture? Well, there was, there was a study done in Denmark which looked at the actual physical contact where you actually do touch somebody else, and it's a, it's a number of seconds during, a, during the course of a game. I think it's a minute and a half or something like that. But you're absolutely right. In terms of being in proximity to somebody, clearly you're, <clears throat> you're closer than two metres to a player quite often on a pitch. But I did a story a while ago looking at this, and, and there was quite a lot of derision around it. I think even on Sky there was a, a discussion about it, about how you could possibly turn your face away from a player after tackling him. Now, People will say that can't possibly happen. The, the point of that was giving an example of some of the behaviours they may have to try and learn in terms of modifying the way they react on a pitch and thinking about, well, do I need to be that close to somebody? Do I need to actually behave in that way? Do I try and avoid face-to-face -face contact as much as possible? Can I try and move away? And I know that's completely anathema to people. It's a complete different way of playing football. But we're in, a, we're in what that, that, the phrase everyone's using is new normal. And I think football has to adapt, at least for the time being. I think for the time being, football has to adapt, and we all have to adapt our lives. Our lives are not going to be the same, so possibly there are things you can do on a football pitch slightly differently, just slightly differently than what you're doing usually when you play football. Interesting stuff. OK. I'll give it a go, Jason. We've got to go to a break right now, <laughs> but we will be with you after this. Welcome back to the Sunday Supplement. Of course, we're talking about football's resumption and the protocols that have been put in place for non-contact training this week. Uh, Sean Custis, what have you been writing about in terms of, I've seen it a few places now, the players complaining because the footballs have been disinfected, they're sticky and, and tricky to use. Yeah. Have you picked that up much? 
Yeah, that's what they say. They are a bit sticky. You can't ha handle them very well for throw-ins as well and stuff like that. Um, we had a piece by Karen Brady in our paper um, the other week saying that in the protocols, it says you've got to disinfect the grass. And she said, how on earth do you disinfect the grass? I did actually get an email from a company that says we do specialise in disinfecting grass <laughs> and uh, we can perhaps explain it to you. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they're actually doing that in Germany, for instance. Just, but just to pick up um, something Jason said there, he quotes uh, the science, various surveys, and all that. The problem when you talk to players and managers, and say the more sceptical ones, is they don't trust the science, which is like a lot of people, just the general public. It is. I mean, even yesterday, I'm reading that now coronavirus doesn't linger on surfaces as much as we thought. So actually, you can touch surfaces when previously people thought you couldn't. As, um, an experiment the other week says actually it travels a lot further than two metres. It really travels six metres. And anybody who runs past you who's sweating can transfer it to, to your body. So again, it is understandable that players aren't sure whether to stick or twist. And you can always, I suppose, quote the science that suits your argument and also, converse, you quote the quote the science that goes against it as well. So um, that, to me, is the reason why players and managers are still unsure about whether it's safe to restart. No, I, I totally understand that. The only thing I'd say to follow on from that is you've got a group of people with the medical, the doctors and the medical staff at football clubs who spent all their time basically looking at how to look after players, how to make sure they're safe and fit. And these guys are going with these protocols because they believe they're the right things to do right now. I think they've all often in the past been accused of being too careful in the way they look after players. They're not going to risk their reputations. I don't think they're going to risk their profession to do things that they think aren't safe. And I think stage we reached out right now, I think, is safe for the players. I totally understand all the arguments around the concerns they have and the conflicting science and everything else. But I think this, the medical protocols as they stand right now do appear to be safe. I think one important factor in this is if you talk to anyone involved in the physio side of sport, the doctors, whatever, they will say the worst thing you can do if you're playing sport is, is to hold back or try and change the way you play. So if you're coming back from an injury, for example, don't try and accommodate it. You've got to go in as you would always go in. And um, I've spoken to a lot of physios who say the worst injuries they see, the most of them they see, are sports people trying to adapt, holding back, doing something differently. So I think the key is not these little tweaks that make players behave in a different manner and try and absorb that into their normal game. The key is to make them feel as relaxed as possible when they are playing, that they are in an environment that is as safe as it can be. And that is why the, the testing and then testing again and then isolating if you've got um, a temperature or whatever, or a positive, you know, case of it, that's when you can play properly. You can't play football if you actually believe by tackling a player or being close to a sweaty player that you're going to contract the virus. It won't work. You have to set up training and matches to be safe and tell, tell them this is as safe as it can be. Go for it. Don't try and do small adjustments because then you're going to get... Um, hamstrings tweaked, broken legs, things going wrong, and the rhythm of the match not being the same. There's no point playing football unless you play it properly. Alison, how much do you think, though, the the expert advice, the medical advice, the doctors, physios, etc., within a football club are pro probably subconsciously undermined their authority in the minds of players? Because, of, of course, those very same players at night, like the rest of us, They'll be watching the government briefings. They'll be reading the front ends of the newspaper. And there is conflicting advice, left, right and centre. So how much harder does that make it for the medical side of football, or indeed football in general, to convince players that it is safe? Because it changes on a daily basis. We're not doing what we did a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We've gone forwards, backwards, sideways in some cases. How difficult is it going to be for them to be completely, as you say, relaxed and confident? Well, there's, there's one advantage in that the players have their health in the hands of these professionals that they know really well anyway. They trust them week in, week out. Clubs 
especially big clubs, they test players all the time. They know everything about every player. They have blood tests, whatever. They know everything. They know if you're going to get a cold, if you just had a cold, you didn't know you had a cold. They know it. So I think the relationship between the players and the medical staff at the clubs is good and there's a lot of trust there. And I think to get over the stumbling block you mentioned there in the science and the briefings always seem to be a little bit different and there's lots of conflicting advice in the end is to look at the bigger picture which is if and um, I'm repeating myself here but if you test and test and test and the latest figures are so encouraging then you you will feel as a footballer I'm in a privileged position I can do my job with as much science behind me as possible and the figures will make them feel reassured if they know there are no positive tests at their club or at the club they're about to face they'll feel fine. I think it was um, alarming, though, to see what Watford was saying uh, in Saturday morning's papers about the fact there were six players who were staying away. Now, I accept that's only at one club, but if one club loses what may be the equivalent of half a team, that seriously skews the competition. Uh, if there are other clubs, players who look at that and think, hang on a sec, I was thinking that I might be staying away. I should be staying away for my family's sake. Uh, Nigel Pearson was raising the concern about the fact his father lived with him and he had to move him back to his own house because he was worried he would infect him. If other players look at that and think, you know, I'm not being careful enough. I'm not being faithful to, um, I'm not treating my family correctly because I should be worrying more about their health, then they might be going to have a rethink and say, you know what, Watford's caution is right and maybe I should be thinking that way. Um, I, I do feel that what Watford, Watford have spoken pretty sensibly about it. They've, they've weighed up both sides, Tom Cleverley this morning, saying how much he's desperate to get back to action, but also that if there is a second spike, if, if, if it gets worse again, that could KO the Premier League season completely. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. However, when we look at Germany, we keep tracking that and thinking, well, it hasn't happened there yet, so hopefully it won't happen here. I think one of the discussions that will take place this week, probably on the Friday at the Premier League, is curtailment. And one of the things we seem to be talking about at the moment is the kind of you know the concern that players have, the managers have, as to whether or not it seems to be that we're coming back too quickly. Um, and if, if that is what everyone believes, then we're going to have to start discussing about what happens next. And what happens next is curtailing this season. The season now ends. Now, there's been a big argument about the kind of you know, the calendar and what happens, whether or not how deep into the summer we can go, when the new season has to start, whether we can delay the new season. It's quite clear the Premier League don't want to do that, but they don't want to go any later than September for the start of the new season. So the decision has to be made. Is it safe enough to start? Is it safe enough to convince everyone that they can, they can train and work towards playing again in June? Or do we stop the season? And that's going to be a decision that's going to be made fairly soon. I think the options are going to be on the table on Friday. What do you want to do? Do you want, do you want to contail this season at some point? Or do you want to try and get it back on? And I think at some point that decision has to be made that what is what? What do people want to do here? Do we want to try and play the season out, or do we want to stop and say it's not safe enough? I understand all the concerns, but phase one of these protocols, as far as I can see, are extremely safe. And I think at the moment we're almost in a psychological barrier with some people, some players and managers in particular, to try and get over that to move on to the next phase. But they will have to make a decision. You know, if the season ends, there are huge ramifications, not just in terms of sport, but in terms of the economic impact it can have on the, on football. And that discussion is coming close. One of the biggest issues which they're going to have to talk over very soon is not just about curtailment, but what happens if you restart and then you have to stop? That is actually the hardest one because I think that throws up all sorts of legal problems. Teams will maybe leapfrog over each other, but there might be some with it still with a game in hand, etc. but we've actually restarted. Can we reset and go back to where we were and therefore judge, the, judge it on that basis? Do we do weighted point system? But some teams may have played and, and some not. Um, that, that would be the worst possible scenario to start and then stop. The others aren't great, but that one's the worst. What's interesting is Richard Masters, the Premier League Chief Executive, said last week that they're going to try and get those two outstanding games, the ones that are between Aston Villa and Sheffield United, Arsenal and Manchester City, which takes everyone up to the same number of matches, get those two games played quite early when football does resume because of that very fear that they may have to stop the season 
uh, once it started again. But what I do, I do find it quite exasperating when people talk about legal avenues and legal threats and legal action being taken because we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're dealing with a pandemic. You know, I think that the fact that people are talking about taking a legal route, and I know there's so much riding on this, and I think Oliver Holt wrote a column on this in the Mail on Sunday this morning, and I broadly agree with him that at some point people have to understand there's almost a common good here. And if football has to stop, then do you really, really, really have to take legal action? Do you really have to think about that? If you look at the way that Port Vale reacted with League Two, they were just outside the playoffs, and they have said, OK, fine, for the common good of the game, we, we, will, we will agree that curtailment is the right option right now. And I really think, that obviously, there are some teams that are obviously going to go down from the Premier League, and it's going to be very harsh on them, but we are 75% through the season. And it's very difficult for those, those clubs to reconcile that. But do they really want to go down the route of legal action? Jason, you can be as frustrated as you like, but if you are the owner of one of those clubs who has millions of pounds riding on it, you don't really care about the rest. You don't care about that legal ramification. You just think, I have to protect my club. I have to protect this community. I have to fight for everything to stay in, be it the championship, League One, League Two, not go out not go out of the league. You're, you're looking at, you know, saying, oh, come on, um, crack on everybody, behave, understand it's for the greater good. But everybody has self-interest. You can't deny that. Players, managers, owners, and they will fight for what is right for them. And that is understandable too. Alison, how how close do you think we are? I mean, Jason talks said that it's going to be discussed on Friday, but what's your feeling? Do you, do you think we are fifty fifty resume, or what? What's your gut feel as to where we are? My gut feel is, my gut feel is we're at a tipping point, but I think it will tip in favour of. Resumption, not curtailment. And just to just to go to Jason's point about, you know, it's terrible for clubs to start thinking about legal action and putting putting their self interest to the fore. Actually, if if you represent the community, as Sean indicated, you do have a moral obligation to do what's best for that community. Otherwise, you know, six months, twelve months time, people are going to point the finger at you for not doing all you could to save something that was precious in that community. OK, we'll take a break. Go on, Jason. Go on. Sorry, the point I'm trying to make just quickly is, you know, you talk about legal action, but how, who's that going to hurt? Who's that going to gain? And the, the fact is, if you try and sue the Premier League, I think it's going to be very difficult in the first place. But also, you know, the, the ramifications of that, how long that will take, it's going to be very difficult to, to sort that out. But I, I just don't know what the, the, the ultimate aim is of suing something, because... At some stage, you have, you have to make a decision as to whether we're going to try and get this game played or stop the season. And that's it. That is it. What, what, what else can you do? We're in the middle of a pandemic here. So what else can you do? OK, well, we do have to take a break right now, but we'll see if we can come up with some solutions to the question that Jason posed right after this. On the Sunday supplement this morning, we've been discussing football returning, protocols in place, and the vote that takes place this week, potentially returning to full contact training. But perhaps it's a, a good time to look back at one of the headlines from this morning's newspapers. David Dean in Sean's paper, The Sun, he has a proposal, the former vice chairman of Arsenal. He says, look, recalibrate the season. Let's not put ourselves under pressure. You know, we could finish this season October, November, and then, he also goes on to say, hopefully fans will be allowed back in the stadia by Feb, hopefully. Take all the pressure off. Let all the players feel comfortable return and recalibrate and run, run next season from February through to November. You've got the 2022 World Cup in November. So the following season is skewed as well. And before you say it, the Euros as well, Sean. He actually says, you know, it's it's a long season. It's still a 10-month season, so the Euros could be accommodated. Is, is this actually forward thinking? Rather than rush, rush, rush now, yeah, finish the game. Keep the integrity of the league. No need for suing. Competitions will be completed, but just relax. Don't be in a rush to go back now. David was a hugely influential figure, wasn't he, in the Premier League in the past and uh, would have had a massive say, I think, uh, 
in in what's going on now had he still been involved with Arsenal. I think we should listen to what he has to say. I do feel, though, that makes all sorts of difficulties in itself to start in February, November. We've got all sorts. Fitting in the Euros, what, I do what think, difficulties? Is, is, is very difficult. Well, fitting in international What's football. What's the difference, Sean? Sure. Right, qualifiers for uh, for the Euros. You finish your season. Let's say you finish it in September. How are you going to do all the qualifiers we need to do for the Euros? How are the players going to get fit again when they're not actually playing with their clubs? You go back. You then have to go back with your clubs. Say in January, early January. You'll then have to play those European qualifiers before that, will you? Then we've got to fit in the Euros in the middle. Um, where does the Champions League fit in? I presume we still want to have a Champions League and a Europa League. Uh, where does your FA Cup fit in? Where does your League Cup fit in? I, it's, it, you know, I understand why he's saying that related to the 2022 World Cup, but I think there are huge ramifications for other competitions and particularly international football, which I do think is in danger of getting squeezed out in all these other discussions. Again, I understand why it might be uh, playing second fiddle in owners' eyes because they want to get some revenue back and actually they probably don't care much about international football, but an awful lot of people do and I don't see how it fits into any calendar right now. There was a proposal, Alison, I don't know if you remember it, uh, a few days ago, or maybe longer, I get confused these days, um, of, of playing th maybe three international fixtures or four international fixtures in November. So what do you think of David Dean's proposal? And also, do we need to be a bit more flexible? And in terms of getting football back, should we give ourselves more breathing space? Uh, well, I, I agree with the sentiment completely behind David Dean's article, because what's really bugging me about a lot of the discussion is why we are prepared, some of us, to throw away 75% of matches that have been played, throw away all the emotion, energy, skill, tactical acumen that has gone into achieving the points that those clubs have, throw that away and concentrate on making sure everything's finished on time for events and schedules and leagues that have yet to start. I have no emotional attachment at all to what happens next season because I don't know anything about it. I have no feeling for it. I didn't even, don't even know who's going to be in the Premier League or in the Championship or whatever. What matters most, what is the priority, is finishing what you know. It's like it's... It's like saying, I, I, I've been in a really long-term relationship, but I just, just seeing someone down the road looks rather nice. Well, I'm going to concentrate on that person and forget the relationship I've got with someone closer to home. We should be concentrating and making the priority the season that we have and finishing it. And, and that, the good thing about that attitude is that if you're starting um, the new season on a different date, you can draw up rules and regulations to allow for that. So you scrap the potential legal problems for changing the rules this season and you start a new season with COVID-19 parameters and say, because of the pandemic, we're going to have to do this, this and this. And also I would say international sport, I mean, there's a chance that the Olympics may not happen at all. We don't know what international travel is going to look like. So I think talking about, um, you know, games beyond our borders is is not the priority at the moment. It's getting the domestic games back running properly. What was really interesting was right at the start of all of this, just talking to people at the Premier League, senior people at the Premier League, they said there was a desire not to um, damage the integrity of next season. And they almost put that priority ahead of, of finishing this season from the start. And that, that surprised me. That surprised me because they, they talked about a cut-off day in terms of if we don't get this season finished by such and such a date, we have to stop because otherwise we damage next season. And there seems to be a desire not to damage two seasons. I, I completely agree. I, I, I don't have a problem with thinking radically about this and absolutely looking at the calendar completely. And obviously UEFA have made their decision, but they can, they can unmake their decision. It can be done again. We can look at the whole calendar. We've got the Qatar World Cup coming up, which is going to change things anyway in terms of how we, we organise the calendar of football. Um, so that decision's already been made. So why can't the, the decision be made to actually recalibrate football right now for next season so that, so that next season works better for everyone? And, and you touch on things such as air travel, but also fans in the stadium. We're talking about fans not being in the stadium 
at least until January. So we're going to have the start of next season, the first half of next season, no, no fans in the stadium. And that's, that's going to feel wrong as well. So I actually agree. I think it's a, it's a good idea, but it was one that was shelved very, very early on in this process. And that was a surprise to me how quickly all the authorities were saying, no, we can't damage next season. We've got to protect the integrity of next season. Next season in the Premier League, as the calendar stands at the moment, has to start by September the 12th. And, nobody, and, and I know why they're saying that, because they need 34 weekends and 34 midweeks to fit in all the games around, obviously, the Euro starting in June. So suddenly we're boxing ourselves into a corner and creating bigger problems because that decision's already been made and the international calendar obviously is set. And, and the biggest issue of all with all of the whole of football is football's full. I mean, there's no wriggle room in football. The calendar is, is full anyway, so we've got to try and create more room and actually maybe a chance to take a deep breath with FIFA and UEFA, with the Premier League, with all the, the, the European leagues and think how can we actually do the right thing for this season, for next season, but also for the future of football and for what it means for the fans might be just to completely rip it all up and think we'll start again in in February or whatever and look at how we can try and do that. The, but the problem with that also, obviously, the biggest problem with all of that is the economic argument. I know people, again, get frustrated with this, but football needs the money. Football needs to be played. You know, Otherwise, the industry is going to suffer, and not just the lower leagues, but the Premier League as well. So that, there's, there's, there are huge ramifications for that. So it would need a whole rethink of the way we do football if that is to happen. Sean, we were talking right at the start of the show about players returning. Would they feel confidence returning uh, to training, the safety of the environment? And, it, 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 you know, confidence is like a, a, a house of cards anyway. If something starts to wobble, the whole lot can go. Let's bring this very much up to date. Bournemouth have announced that one of their players tested positive. If you were a Bournemouth player now... How potentially would that change your thinking about returning to training? Uh, now, obviously, the individual player or staff member will have been tested and then will be isolated. But it, would it shake your confidence that somebody within your group, somebody you potentially have been around this past week, has tested positive? Yeah, I'd feel a little less secure than I did yesterday. Similarly, if somebody who I work with were I working from an office, I'd also tested. I remember when we first thought we had a positive test at work, um, the whole place, the whole floor was deep cleaned instantly. Uh, I don't think that happens uh, so much anymore. We've sort of had to adapt in many ways, but it's not just getting a positive test. What did Man City players think when they saw Sergio Aguero, their standout player, if you like, saying, I'm scared? He, he, he had never a positive test, but he said, I'm scared to return. Now, as a City teammate, you think, well, if Sergio Aguero's scared to return, then um, I think we'd better listen. We'd better listen to him. So it's not just about the it's not just about the tests. Alison, what did you think of the way that the media in general covered Danny Rose's comments? It, it, he, he made them very bluntly. He basically said, uh, used a few choice words and said, you know, I don't care about the morale of the nation. That's not down to me. Why? Why should I be doing this to lift the morale of the nation? What do you think of the way that was reported, and indeed what he actually said? I, I think it was reported responsibly, um, partly because uh, the media knows Danny Rose really well, and they know he has opinions, and he's not afraid to to air them. Um, and you know, we're, we're so there's a dearth of players who are brave enough to say what they think as opposed to what they're told they ought to say. So I think um, I think he was given a platform and a fair hearing, if you like. Um, the, the, I think the, 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 the problem with it all is that football and the club football, it's all a team game, isn't it? And you're all supposed to be on the same page and moving forward together. So when you get mavericks or maverick opinions it does throw up questions of um, uh, unity in the squad. And as, as you were saying about Aguero, you know, if, if one player breaks free from, from the squad and says something about what they personally feel, we're so unused to it that it becomes, it, it, the importance of it is heightened, I think. And that's an inevitable consequence of media attention on these very famous people but in fact, what we need to do is, is realise that's just a reflection of society. And in your own friendship group or in your own family, 
you will have people who feel very differently about things. And it's only by airing concerns that you solve them. So I think it's really good that players are able and feel, you know, emboldened to be able to say, I'm worried. I don't, I don't know. Does football really matter? I don't know if I care. I mean, people will be thinking that about everything in their lives. They'll be thinking, oh, I, I, I'm never going to care about what I wear ever again. Why did I bother? I'm going to let the garden go to pot. What does it matter? People will have those feelings about things that we used to be important. And then they will slowly get back to normality and realise, deep breath, they can, they can cope, hopefully. But I think airing it is good because it's a reflection of society because it's, it's been so peculiar. It's good to know that people you maybe look up to or, or are your heroes also have those doubts. I, I, I felt, Jason, that potentially Danny Rose's comments were positioned negatively because there is such a desire from so many quarters, um, particularly the fact, also the government as well, for football to resume. Do you, do you think that could have contributed to his comments being viewed negatively? I think it was also the strength of the words he used. Um, but I do, I do agree with you, Jeff. I think, obviously, once the government say things like it's good for the morale of the nation, obviously, you know, you don't really want to be lectured by this government, do you, to be honest? Let's be, let's, let's, let's be honest about it. So I can understand why Danny Rose is frustrated with that. And, yeah, to a degree, it's not for football to, to lift the morale of the nation, although the return of football is an important part of society and there will be an excitement around that and people will be pleased about that. And... At the same time, I think some people are probably a little bit frustrated or, or feel that footballers are in a privileged position because clearly Premier League footballers earn an awful lot of money. Um, it is easy for them to talk about not going back to work when they're on the salaries they're on. And that's that those salaries are being honoured. Obviously, some players have taken pay, uh, wage deferrals or wage cuts, uh, but they're still you know earning huge amounts of money. So, so people get frustrated with that as well. But I, I agree with Alison. I think we, we want to be in a situation where people feel able to articulate how they feel and feel that they've got the confidence to do that, and that should be taken on board. We shouldn't all feel the, uh, the pressure to do things. We shouldn't all feel that because our teammates are doing things or our colleagues are doing things that we have to do things. And I think everyone's opinion should be, should be respected. And I think if you do have concerns, then we should encourage people to, to voice those concerns and, and give them the platform to voice those concerns. We have to take a break once again. After we're talking championship and leagues one and two, potential curtailment and also salary caps. Welcome back to the Sunday Supplement. This week we are in the company of Jason Burt of The Telegraph, Sean Custis of The Sun and Alison Rudd of The Times. We've been focusing mainly on the Premier League so far, but Jason, um, out of the Championship, Leagues 1 and 2, who would you say is in the most, how shall I put it, interesting position right now with where they go forward? Who, where is the less certain ground? I think it's well. I think it's League One, really, where you've got a clear split between some of the clubs who definitely want to play, definitely want to carry on. The clubs basically in the playoff positions and just below, in, uh, including Sunderland and Ipswich, who have made it quite clear. I think there's a group of six clubs who've made it quite clear that their intention is to see out the season. But I think the way it's moving in League One is similar to League Two in that we're looking more towards a curtailment. What's been interesting with the, with the English Football League is how long they're taking to sort this out because they almost keep pushing it back and pushing it back and. I think at the moment we've got a situation where they, the clubs have been asked for their observations before Tuesday. Uh, there's a board meeting on, on Wednesday. They'll probably then go out for a vote. So that will take five days to notify the clubs. So you're talking about even next week, not, not, sorry, not this week, but the following week before we have a resolution as to what happens there. It looks like it will move towards a points per game uh, system with then playoffs for League One and League Two. And crucially, with clubs like Tranmere in particular, relegation. But there's no consensus at all in these leagues. We had it to a degree with League Two earlier on. They did an indicative vote saying they wanted to suspend the season. But we've also seen some pushback on that with the, with the FA and the EFL saying, no, we actually do want relegation. So Stevenage obviously looked like they had a reprieve, uh, may, may still end up going, going down. So I think the problem with all three of those leagues is they're all looked at as separate entities in a way, even though they all come to the umbrella of the EFL. And then with the Championship, 
you've got a situation where a lot of clubs, or a number of clubs, sorry, um, haven't really got an awful lot to play for. So they're looking at it financially and thinking, we lose a lot of money because when they're, they're biggest, the biggest bulk of their income comes from some gate receipts and so on, not so much from television money. So they're looking at it thinking, we're going to pay all this money for testing, and, and we're, not, we're not really going to go up, we're not really going to go down. Um, so therefore, they're, not, they're fairly lukewarm about playing. But the problem is, if the Championship doesn't play, the Premier League might turn around and say, well, we're not having relegation then, which is obviously what some of the clubs are saying. Why should we have relegation into a division with, and they have promotion from a division where they're not even going to play these games? So I think they'll try and get the championship done. I think League One and League Two will go for curtailment and playoffs. The League One and League Two curtailment, though, were they going to have promotion relegation, though, Jason? Because, as you yes, say... Yes, I think, I think sure, so. Surely that's so, a bit... Yeah. Based yeah, on I do. Per yeah, game. I think. I think. Yeah, I think. It's obviously, we, they've looked at two systems. One has been points per game on unweighted, and on, on weighted. Yeah. As you probably know, the difference is that with weighted, you take into account points earned from away games and so on a bit more. But I think it will be unweighted PPG to de- determine the final places. And the interesting thing there with League One in particular is you see a situation where Wickham, in eighth place, suddenly go up into the playoffs and Peterborough drop out of them, and that's going to cause a lot of consternation. We've already talked about the threat of legal action. I think Peterborough are one of the clubs who are threatening to take legal action if that happens. I think what football fans have been really surprised about is what Jason alluded to there, which is that the leagues actually make independent decisions. I think we would be under the impression, certainly with the Championship League 1 and League 2, that there would be some consistency across the board, and the EFL would rule, well, it's like this. They have to be relegated either on points per basis game or uh, or whatever. You have to be promoted, etc. National League clubs comes up, and that's how it should be. In, of course, in the old days, probably I'm right in thinking when the FA controlled the game, the FA would have said, "Right, it's like this," and this would have applied to first division, second, third, fourth. This is how it's going to be. We've decided it's X, and you wouldn't have been able to ring anybody to find out why because they wouldn't have answered the phone. They wouldn't have had communications officers. They would have just said, that's our decision. This is how it is. Tough. Get on with it. But now there is so many separate entities trying to make decisions that it leaves football in a very confused state. Alison, how much do you think the picture is emerging, though, for understandable reasons, that leagues one and two are making their decisions based on if they can actually operate. Can they afford to get back this season? Can they actually afford to put the games on? And facing up to the reality where they rely on their gate money far more than the, the leagues above them, the reality is that there is no gate money in sight for the foreseeable future. No, and that is the driving force, I think, in, in League Two saying curtail and League One edging towards that. They would love to be able to complete the season, but the cost analysis doesn't doesn't weigh up for them at all and when you move into the championship there are still cost issues um, as has been said you know for, for clubs that are really in danger of neither going up nor going down why would they go through these very expensive procedures not bolstered by having any fans to pay gate money I think really if the Premier League are keen for the integrity of their division for there to be relegation and promotion, they should fund the testing for the championship clubs that cannot afford it. There must be a very simple formula to work out whether you can afford it or not and make sure everybody gets the exact same um, sort of chemistry there. They're they all doing the science the same, all protected the same, and they don't have to worry about the cost of doing it. And that way you protect the integrity of the Premier League and... And that's a privilege to have that integrity protected, so pay for it. So there should, there should not be, really, a uh, championship club worrying about the cost of testing to the levels that the Premier League will. They should be um, subsidised by the Premier League to be able to do that. But, Jason, once again, we saw this week reports of a potential breakaway in the championship. Do you remember last season, 15 clubs uh, penned an open letter to the FL... It was over the TV deal and apparently talks once again because of a split of opinions in the championship saying, listen, you know, we sh- there should be a Premier League too, which would cast leagues one and two even further adrift. It, just picking up what Alison is saying there, how yeah. much desire do you think to put in place a secure chain, a, if you like a ring fence of care 
um, from drip feeding from Premier League to Championship, to League One, and to League Two, because there's, there's an obvious relationship there. But at the moment, they seem to be acting autonomously. Yeah, I think I think the problem is the step up from League One to League, sorry, League Two to League One isn't that great. The step up from League One to the Championship is huge. And as we know, the separate from the Championship to the Premier League is, is again, huge. So I think the Championship is almost regarded as like a sort of slightly separate entity away from League One and League Two, which is a mistake, clearly. But the biggest problem with the Championship uh, around that is, is the financing of the Championship. Now, we've seen reports, I think uh, Rick Parry, the chairman of the EFL, talked about it at the Select Committee earlier on when he talked about how, you know, for every £100 that the uh, Championship clubs earn on average, they're spending £106 in wages. And that's because of that desire to get back into the Premier League for a lot of clubs. Obviously, they've got parachute payments and so on, the clubs that come down. So that skews things again. So the finances of the Championship in particular are very, very difficult to unpick. And you've got a lot of clubs there who, who are acting almost as separate entities. They're, they're very self-interested. They clearly are desire. The desire is to get into... Their only desire is to get into the Premier League. They don't particularly want to be in the Championship. We've got some very ambitious owners, we've got some owners who are willing to spend a lot of money. League One and League Two often is much more about just survival uh, and just staying in those divisions, obviously apart from a few big clubs in League One who want to get back into the Championship. But I think the Championship is geared towards the Premier League. It is totally geared towards the Premier League. It's geared towards that holy grail of being in the Premier League. And that will always lead to a push towards a possibility of a Premier League Two to marry up the two divisions a little bit more easily because one of the other issues that have been talked about quite a lot at the moment is salary caps. I mean, we can see how they can operate in League One and League Two. But again, in the Championship, that's going to be very, very difficult to implement when you've got clubs coming down from the Premier League with huge wage bills. And obviously, part of the reason why they get substantial parachute payments is to help soften that fall into the Championship. And then you've got clubs coming up from League One with small small wage bills. And the, the difference, the disparity in those two are very difficult to reconcile with a salary cap. So you've, you've got a very much of a hodgepodge of a division where it's, it's, it's a lots of clubs who are coming up from League One or down from the Premier League who've got vastly different environments in which they're operating, vastly different financial parameters in which they operate. So it's very difficult to see how that, oper- that works. And that's why I think there'll always be that drive towards the Premier League too, which I think ultimately will happen because the EFL, League One and League Two, do just feel so separate from the Championship. Sean, the, the, the salary caps is a real hot potato amongst clubs, players, agents. A um, couple of things. Do, do you think this smacks of a couple of things? Opportunism on the part of club owners to be talking about. I mean, how do salary caps, per se, help football return right now? And secondly, in terms of salary caps, is it the, the big problem we have is football returning is it, it the parlous state of the finances, particularly lower down. And this has all been self-inflicted. This has all been brought about by owners, directors, the people who have run these clubs. They've, they've basically spent too much money. Yeah, but all owners spend too much money because, as Jason said, below in the Championship League 1 and League 2, because, as Jason says, the Holy Grail is getting into the Premier League. I think possibly salary caps will... Uh, be possible in League One and League Two, but there are clubs who who still wouldn't want to do it. Those those with more problems over finances would want to do it. But um, as Jason says, they're very separate. League One and League Two, I think, to Championship and Premier League. Where I think I think it'd be impossible to impose it in the Championship. You couldn't do it in the Premier League, but I don't see how you do it in the Championship either. As Jason says, Prem One and Two. Um, it's, it's probably always on the agenda. We've been talking about it forever on this program. I th- you can go back over 20 years when Prem 1 and 2 was first being being discussed. We haven't got there but yet. What, what does that actually mean? Sure. Yeah. What does that actually mean? What, what would that look? What, what difference well, would it be calling it the championship well, or Prem 2? What's the actual Well, as difference? we've seen, Jeff, Jeff, we've just been talking about the separate entities. League 2 are deciding what they do with their promotion relegation, whether to avoid the season. League 1, the same. The championship are out on their own as well. If you bring the championship into the Premier League tent, if you like, and we have Prem 1 and 2, then they presumably will all be um, all be deciding the same things together in the same um, committees. So I can see there is some very big clubs outside the Premier League at the moment. Leeds are well. Leeds may not Massive. be soon. They may be into the into the Premier League. Massive big clubs who actually I would love to see in the Premier League, or I would love to see 
on a bigger stage. But it's not just now we're talking about Prem 1 and 2. Back in the discussions again is European Super League because Premier League clubs do not want to be bailing out clubs lower down the pyramid. We've got a story in our paper this morning from Alan Nixon saying that it could be up to 200 million that the government want Premier League clubs to pump into the lower leagues. That's, so that's another 10 million on their bill on, on top of maybe a 15 million pound broadcast bill, which they have to pay back. And eventually there are owners at Premier League going, you know what? We don't, I don't want to be bailing them out anymore. I don't care if it's good for the community or society or that we're all inclusive. We want to be off playing with uh, the big boys abroad. I accept at the moment with international travel, that'd be very difficult. But three, four years down the line, they're getting heat from abroad, some of the big clubs abroad, saying, hey, this is what you should be doing. Don't worry about those little clubs down there. You should be playing with the big boys all the time every week. And therefore, the Super League will be back on the table. Incredible. Talking about the Super League, and we haven't even got our own football right now. But yeah, you did mention the big boys abroad, Sean, which is a nice cue, because after the next interval, we're discussing the return of the Bundesliga, the pros and cons, how much we've enjoyed it or otherwise so far. Of course, we haven't got any football to watch right now, but plenty of lonely eyes have turned towards Germany and the Bundesliga. In her column this morning, Alison has written, well, how can I put it? She's penned an open admiration for the Bundesliga. Alison, I enjoyed your piece. It sounds like you, you find yourself strangely attracted to a league you don't necessarily always follow. Would that be a fair synopsis? Yeah. Uh, the idea was... Everyone sort of launched in on the Bundesliga first time we were able to watch it and were left thinking, oh, I don't know, is it just a novelty act? Can I build a relationship with this league? So I thought I'd watch it again and see what I'd learned from the first time, whether it could be made into a more enjoyable experience and what I could apply from that to watching maybe Premier League, Premier League games under the same um, environment with no fans. And I discovered that what matters is uh, the commentator. The commentator needs to have the sort of voice that you can pretend is speaking over crowd noise. If you can buy into that, it makes it hugely enjoyable, relatively speaking. And it's good to have people in the room in which you're watching the football that are making lots of noise and maybe scoffing or laughing or maybe doing something completely separate. But again, anything to distract you, the viewer, from the fact you're not hearing things the same way once you've got that ambiance right, then you can really settle in, I think, and watch watch football, even the Bundesliga, which wasn't something I watched week in, week out before, and really enjoy it. And actually, I think having it being the only football available is, is, is a boon because they are technically very good, these German teams. I didn't know quite that, you know, all in, in all elements of, of the division, there are some good players. So I had not seen live Kai Havertz before, plays for Leverkusen, and he got a big build-up before the game. Sure enough, he looks the real deal. He's 20 years old, scored a beautiful goal, very composed, scored a penalty, looks like he could fit into any big team in the world. And you've got all these subplots going on. Um, if you can find a way to cope with it being peculiar, then you, you can actually really enjoy it. Sean, how do you think we could minimise the peculiarities should football return? And it is very much a hypothetical question. I quite, I quite like, Sean, how do you think it would go? Do you think it would be easier on the eye if clubs here, the same as uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach, put cardboard cutouts of people in the seats? Now, don't scoff. Sounds ridiculous. But when I'm watching the Bundesliga, I don't like seeing all the empty rows. It's not the same as, of course, having real people there, but you like the idea of the cardboard cutouts? Yeah, I, I don't mind it. And David Dean, who we were talking about earlier, they were reminiscing about the Arsenal wall when they were um, redeveloping the ground way back, way back when. And we were wondering, actually, what happened to the Arsenal mural? Um, that got a lot of criticism at the time and they piped uh, pipe noise coming into the stadium. I, I, I've got to the point whereby I'm not noticing so much the um, the empty seats, I've got to admit. I, I, I agree it enhances it when you put in um, cardboard cutouts, but I'm not hugely 
bothered by it anymore. It, 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 it affected my viewing maybe last week, but this week I concentrated. I was watching much more the football. Um, I'm finding the football a little bit knockabout at the moment. I mean, Bayern Munich Eintracht yesterday was hugely entertaining, but there's a slight feeling that it's not quite as full-on competitive as it would usually be with fans in the stadium. I don't sense the same edge. I don't see players arguing with referees the way they maybe would have done. And obviously, that's a good thing too. I don't really feel that players are full-on piling into tackles and, and you know, to hell with the consequences, if you like. It seems just a little bit standoffish to me uh, that they, they're going through the motions a little bit. Maybe that's because, say, for the likes of Dortmund and Bayern Munich or the teams I've been watching they're confident they're going to win the game. But it's it's fun rather than serious, I, I feel. And we may find the same thing in the Premier League. Say the consequences of conceding a goal don't seem so dramatic. The brilliance of scoring a goal doesn't seem so amazing. Yet the games themselves, I've, I've quite enjoyed. They're quite fun. Uh, another um, concept, Jason, I, I quite liked, but if you like, and that's probably more of a boost for the players. So imagine the little box. We're in a, a box here now. We could all see each other. I can't remember which German club it was. What they did was they put in a big screen, and there's about yeah. I think there's about thirty or forty of their fans all watching the game live. Player scores, runs to the screen like this, and all the fans are shouting back at him like that. Not bad. Yeah, no, absolutely. And no, I agree. I think I think what's interesting about this is it gives the Premier League an opportunity to, to, to watch these games, the Bundesliga matches, and look at them as visual spectacles as well as football matches and think how we can how we can do it better, really. And obviously Sky Sports will be a be a be a huge part of that because they obviously they're gonna be broadcasting an awful lot of games. So I think they've got an opportunity almost to look at this as a as a as a broadcast experience and think, well, we've got a lot, we've got a chance here to change a few little things and do a few little gimmicks and do a few little innovations. Okay, it's not the same, it's nowhere near as good. We haven't got the fans in the stadium. Completely agree with Sean and, and Alison. I mean, it, it's been good to watch, but it's not been quite, you know, obviously it's not the same, it clearly isn't, but it's not as bad as perhaps we feared it would be. And it can be a bit better. And I think this is an opportunity for the broadcasters in particular to think of innovations and to put those forward. I think there is an advisory group that I think uh, is looking at what can be done with the Premier League games and whether or not we can broadcast them slightly differently. As you say, have those sort of engagement with the fans or some sort of other other gimmicks or other other things they can do to try and enhance the experience. And it, there may be things that come out of that, actually, which going forward... We think we quite like that idea. That's something maybe we can keep when when, when the fans do return to the stadium, when football is back to the uh, more normal normal life. Maybe we can carry on with some of the things um, we can come up with the next few weeks. So I think it's a real opportunity for the Premier League in particular to have a look at the Bundesliga. It's a very similar league in many, many ways, obviously with the style of football and everything. And think, well, what, what are they doing well and what are they doing not so well? And what can we, what can we copy and what can we improve upon? Alison, it's not just the action on the pitch which has been analysed in Germany. Erling Haaland, uh, the striker for Borussia Dortmund, was widely widely criticised for uh, an interview he gave uh, post-match. What, what did you make of the criticism he received for basically giving one-word answers to the interview? It then transpired that there's far more to it later on. But what did you make of the whole escapade? Well... <laughs> I think the, the 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 fear or the accusations were that this is the ultimate expression of media training, that there's a lack of trust between um, broadcasters and players, if you like, that if they say anything um, at all, it's going to be uh, misinterpreted or because so so little of real interest is ever said that as soon as you do say something interesting, you get a massive headline and the repercussions of what you said are, are, are played up to uh, the nth degree. And this is the only way you can stop yourself being negatively in the spotlight is to not quite go on strike, but practically go on strike so that when you're, when you're uh, interviewed live, you, you say nothing at all. Say nothing at all. Um, but this is not new. I remember um, way back when Stevie Highway, who was my hero at Liverpool when I was a kid, he got he got so cross with the banality and the obvious nature of questions from uh, pitch side <laughs> interviewers. This is before your time, Jeff. That he he would he would re 
just ask the question back all the time. So they'd say, great goal, Steve. And he'd go, do you think so? Was it? And, and they'd just, <laughs> they would go, oh, what's he doing that for? But of course, Steve Harvey went to university, so he was able to be that intellectual about it. Jeff, I think um, what you're referring to with Harland is the fact that actually the start of the interview, interview he gave slightly longer answers and uh, was a little bit more mm. engaged, if you like, with the report. And then you got down to the last 30 seconds and it was, yep, OK, fine, et cetera. And that was the cut, which certainly went around social media. But honestly, I'd be really interested mm. to know what you thought of it, because you must have been in that situation a number of times. And let's be honest, with footballers in our own Premier League, where you think, come on. He is just not engaging here. And the difficulty for you to keep it going for, say, another 30 seconds, knowing all you're going to get is one-word answers. When we do it as, um, say, newspaper, digital reporters, it sometimes doesn't matter if they do that. We just think, uh, well, we can't, we can't use that. It was useless. Whereas for you, that is on air, and you have to try and make it work, which must be very difficult. Well, I was interested in the, uh, the Harland situation because... When I read it, uh, and before I'd seen the interview, and he was labelled as arrogant, precocious, you know, he's only 19 years of age, who do you think he is, his disdain for journalists. And then you dig a little deeper, actually it was the second part of the interview, and he'd answered mm. the first part of the interview quite courteously, maybe not the longest, but he certainly fulfilled uh, the job. And quite, it's quite often a way that when you're interviewing somebody uh, that... For them, they signal that they feel they've said what they need to say, they've answered your questions, so the answers can get a little shorter. Maybe not as abrupt as his, not one-word answers, but it's a signal that it's drawing to its conclusion. Um, yes, of course, there's been many, many a time uh, when somebody doesn't want to talk, but all it does is it brings home. The, the bottom line is, Jason, you cannot interview somebody who doesn't want to be interviewed. No matter, you can, all the golden rules, don't ask closed questions. You can start questions with how. If they don't want to be interviewed, you're not getting an interview. No, I, I completely agree, Jeff. And I think it was obviously very unfair on Harland that it was clipped the way it was. And then when you watch the whole interview, it's slightly mm. different. But at the same time, he still did give monosyllabic answers towards the end, which is awkward. And I think what frustrates me a little bit, OK, he's only 19 and so on, but I think football... It's such a big thing in terms of the media now. And the media is such an important part of football, not least the broadcasters who are paying a lot of money to watch, to, to show these games. So the interview is part of the process. And I think the players need to accept that and need to engage with their interviewer, not just because it makes them look a bit better, but you know, it's, this, is, this is part of it. You know, you, when you're doing a pitch side interview, I've never done it. You've done it an awful lot. It, I'm, I'm sure it can be quite a nerve-wracking experience if somebody's not, not helping you and it's live on television or whatever, it, it is difficult. And I don't think that's, I don't think it was very helpful of Holland to talk in the way he did towards the second half of that interview. Because if we were doing this program again and we just give one word answers, it, it, it's not going to work, is it? So, you know, he, he, he needs to understand that's part of the process. That's part of him being a professional footballer, earning the salary he is from the revenues that are coming into that football club to pay his wages. And I think it's an important part of, of, uh, of him realising that and, and maybe maturing a little bit. I think players have to accept that, yes, this, this is something they have to go through. Well, thankfully, uh, we haven't had one-word answers. We've had plenty of very eloquent and well-articulated answers from Jason Burt, Sean Custis and Alison Rudd this morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Make sure you join us next week. We'll be back again with Sunday Supplement, going through all of the details of what could be a pivotal week for football. We're at Tipping Point, so make sure you join us next Sunday, 10 a.m. See you then. Goodbye.